in Jesus. Amen. Why don't we stand? I'm going to open in prayer this morning, and we're going to dive into our second part on addictions um, today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that every person sitting here will receive something from your word. God, I thank you that it's, it's not something that's going to return void, but that your word will accomplish what it's meant to accomplish in us today, and we thank you for it. And all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. So um, my prayer is the Lord will help us to get through our material because we have a lot to cover. Um, but uh, I wanted to start this morning in, in a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, verse 13 and 14, and talking a bit about temptation, because we don't hear a lot about it anymore. Temptation is something that we're all going to deal with. Once you're a believer, the enemy will come to tempt you. Amen. Uh, The Bible says that God himself does not tempt you, because he's not tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But sometimes he leads us into temptation, so we can become strong and learn to stand in, in do, and fight the good fight. Amen? The Bible says in James that when we have overcome temptation, we will receive the crown of life, which is promised. So there's, there's a supply of God's spirit, there's a supply of life that comes when we overcome. How many hear what I'm saying? And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Verse 13 and 14, it says, No temptation has overcome you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful. Say, God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with temptation will also make a way of escape. Okay? He always makes a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Okay? And so God allows us to be tempted, but not beyond what we can bear. And you wonder, you know, why God would allow you to be tempted, because there's something in the wrestling that creates a strength and an endurance, amen? Uh, We know before humankind was in the garden, Adam and Eve, we understand that there was another kingdom, we understand there were angels that were in, in, and were cast down, a third of the angels were cast down, they were called sons of God as well, they're different than what we are, but they were beings created in the image of God, and iniquity was found in Lucifer, and Lucifer at one point was tempted, but he didn't overcome the temptation and started this whole mess. Amen? And so we're being prepared for eternity to learn to overcome temptation. Okay? And the scripture tells us here, he's not going to allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. But there's something in the wrestling that makes you strong. You know, in the UFC, for those of you who, who, who like wrestling and, and martial arts, um, Conor McGregor was, was unstoppable since 2012. He was the lightweight champion. It, it was, I would say, but he was, for seven years, he, I mean, he, he, just, he was just unstoppable force in the lightweight division. And people said, no one's going to be able to stop this guy. But recently, he met a guy, and um, he's, he's a Russian guy named Habib, and he, he, he was scheduled to fight this guy. And uh, he is actually, um, his father was not afraid to allow him to wrestle when he was a child. He's a jiu-jitsu guy, and he would wrestle. And I have a little video of what his father had him do when he was younger. We're going to bring that up, okay? So when most, most kids were wrestling with other kids, he was wrestling with bears. And so his dad had him learn how to fight a bear, Okay? And this video goes on for like four minutes, but you can stop it, all right? But you can watch it yourself later. But he, he had to wrestle a bear cub, and so his father said, I'm not afraid to let my son learn how to wrestle, because in wrestling you become strong. So when he, when he came into to the ring with Conor McGregor, he was able to, to take him out. Like he's, if you're used to fighting bears, how are you going to do against a man? You see what I'm saying? So, so sometimes the wrestle is good. Say so the wrestle is good. And so the, God will allow you to be tempted, allow these temptations to come so that you, you will learn to stand the, good, stand the good fight. Amen? And when you overcome, you look back and go, hey, that, that was easy. I, 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 you know, I'm ready for the next battle. And you learn to wrestle. You become strong, and you become an overcomer. Okay? And so say, wrestling makes me stronger. Okay? And, um, and so, the next, so in that verse we're reading in 1 Corinthians, you see what it says here? Okay, he will uh, create a way of escape. Verse 14 says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. 
okay? And so when, when temptation comes, the reason why people become addicts or become addicted to stuff is because they're, they're involved in idolatry. What is idolatry? Idolatry is when you put anything first before your spiritual health. When you put anything before your spiritual relationship with God, uh, your relationship with the Lord, um, that can be a form of idolatry, okay? And God wants to not only be first in your life, but he wants to be central to your life. And this is where a lot of people make a mistake, is to say, well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to make sure I, I pray to God first, and then I'm, going to, then I'm going to take care of my kids, and then I'm going to take care of my business. And, and he just becomes part of our agenda, but God is more interested in being central than being first. In other words, he wants to be the center of your marriage. He wants to be the center of your parenting. He wants to be central to you, what you do for a living. He wants, to, he wants to partake in everything that you do. How many hear what I'm saying? That's why Paul, then it makes sense when Paul says that we're to pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Well, you, God is central. Everything you do, you do with God, in God, and for God, and he, you're just aware of him at all times. How many hear what I'm saying? Okay? So God doesn't just become part of your life. He becomes central to your life. Okay? The children of Israel would bring their sacrifices to the temple, but they would also leave and they would go and spend a bit of time worshiping Baal and Ashtoreth, and they were involved with different things, and they were in idolatry, and it was an abomination to the Lord. Amen? And so God wants our relationship to be central. Say, God wants to be central. Amen? And so uh, the reason why, you see, uh, addictions will bring a sense of comfort. And that's why we, we become addicted to things, because it brings a sense of comfort to us uh, when we have, you know, a, how many heard comfort food, right? You have a comfort food, or you have a habit that is your comfort. You know, you come home, I just can't, you know, you might come home from work, and like, I just have to have that glass of wine. I just, it just causes me to relax. Well, you're addicted, you might not be an alcoholic, but you're, you, you're looking for comfort from something other than God. How many hear what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I just have to be with this person all the time or I don't feel good about myself. That's, a, that's an ungodly thing. Amen? We're to find our central addiction in the Lord. There's some good addictions, right? I'm addicted to my wife. That's a good addiction, right? I love my wife. You can, you can have good addictions, but there's also bad addictions when you put your focus and you draw your source of comfort from other sources, okay? Um, and, and we see this here in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13, where the Lord says, For my people have committed two evils. Say, two evils. Okay? Number one, they forsake me, the fountain of living waters. And so we know that God's spirit is, is like a fountain of, of, of water. Water brings life. Water brings nourishment. How, how many know, how, how many have ever been really thirsty and you have a drink and it's like, it's just so refreshing on a hot day, right? And, uh, and, and that's what water does. It brings life. Living water, when we talked in the Old Testament, when we were talking about living water, they were talking about streams of water that were moving. Because anything that sits still, guess what? It becomes stagnant and eventually will begin to, you know, it's not good to drink anymore. But look what it says here. For my people have forsake, had two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and instead they've hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. And back in those days, they would, they would build these out of the stone. They'd dig out these large, these, uh, these large pits out of stone, and then the rainwater and the waters from the streams would fill it up so in the drought season they'd have liquid to drink. But, but what happened is many times the rocks would crack and the water would run out of the cisterns and they wouldn't have any water to drink, so they would turn them into tombs. And that's what happens is if we put our faith in cisterns made with hands, the things that we think are going to bring us comfort, the things we think that are going to bring joy to our lives, and we make our own little cister cisterns, what happens is they're going to crack and they're going to leave you empty. Or leave you with stagnant water instead of living waters. How many hear what I'm saying? Okay? And you end up in a dead place. Okay? Isaiah chapter 44 verse 3 says, I will pour water on a thirsty land. In the ESV it says, In streams on the dry ground, I'll pour out my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. 
And so God wants to open up and pour the floodgates into the dry places of your life. He wants you to have a relationship with him. But here's the key. John chapter 14, verse 16 says this. Our Lord says, I will pray to the Father and I will, he will give you another helper that he may abide with you for a little while. Is that what it says? Forever. And so the Holy Spirit is my comforter. I don't need other things to bring comfort to me. That's why Paul says that, um, you know, uh, be filled with the Spirit, right? Don't be drunk with wine. Don't alter your state with, with other substances, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. How many hear what I'm saying? So God wants us to allow the Spirit to alter our state and bring us into joy and peace and happiness. Amen? We, we don't need other things to do that. This, this is what the scripture is teaching us, is that the Lord, he wants to be the living water in our life. He doesn't want us to build cisterns and try to find our comfort in, in different addictions. He wants us to be free from all these things. Amen? The Holy Spirit is my comforter. Let's say that together. The Holy Spirit is my comforter. Okay? And he's not going anywhere. He's with you. And so he's, he's my comforter, he's my source. And so it, it, it's easy as a believer um, to go from spending time worshiping the Lord because you love his presence and you're addicted to him to just pulling away from that and finding your source of comfort in other things. Other things aren't always bad, but it's when you put them before God. They become addictions. They become that source for us. And the Bible says the answer to all this is the first commandment, which has to do with the condition of your heart. The first commandment has to do with the disposition of our hearts before God, okay? Love is the only thing strong enough to hang the law on. You can't hang the law on your denomination. You can't hang the laws of God on your good works. You have to hang it on a love relationship with God or the whole thing falls down. Amen? So, Camilla and I are going to continue here, uh, just talking about a little bit about addictions here. Um, just bringing up my notes here. <clears throat> Amen? Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Just find out where I was from last week. Amen. Um, we talked last week about what really happens that moves us into this place where we begin to build our own cisterns to find joy and peace and happiness. Is what happens is there's a thing called spiritual bewitchment. Spiritual bewitchment. We see that we see the, the, the Galatians had an issue with this, and Paul had to talk to them and said, who has bewitched you to believe the lie? In other words, the enemy has come and brought a different gospel or just contorted it a bit and made it say something a little different, and now you're moving back into works, and you're moving away from grace. And that's what the enemy does, is he bewitches us, he maligns something so that we think this is truth, but it really isn't truth. Okay? Um, the enemy has spoken harmful untruths about our God, and, and when we believe those lies, we've been bewitched. We have to always come back to the Word of God and say, what does the Word of God say about this situation? Okay? Um, and so what happens in addictions, right, um, there's a lie that comes that there's, there's, there's a false comfort. If, if you do this, you're going to be happy. Didn't, that's how it started in the garden, right? The Bible says the fruit looked like it was good for food. It, it, was, it was enticing. And the enemy used it to deceive Eve and say, listen, if you will eat of the fruit, you will be like God knowing good and evil. And so there was this bewitchment. There was this, like, it, it, there was this lie that was spoken that she believed, and it brought her into a religious system. How many know what I'm saying? All right? And this is exactly what happens um, with addiction, is that we believe the lie. If I, could only, if I could only just have a buzz, I'd be fine. If I, could, if I could get over this stress, if I could just relax for two days, if someone would just post that they like me online and say, you know, I like you, then I'll feel good about myself. And there's this need for the feeling of love. We talked last week about how um, addiction is caused because people have a need to be loved. That's not being fulfilled. Okay? And an enemy wants you to fill that with the wrong thing. Okay? Jesus said, 
In Matthew 22, 37 and 40, Jesus said unto him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And on these, all the laws of the commandments of the Lord will hang. Amen? So let's see where we're going here. Okay. You want to share something for a second? Now? Well, I'll just, well, I just wanted to say to you and just stress that the heart behind, like the truth, truth and mercy has to kiss. So the heart is very, very important behind. We have to know the heart of the Holy Spirit, the heart of God, just like Travis said. We have to hang on love because we can so easily slip, you know, when we're pursuing the highway of wholeness. We've talked about this before, but sometimes we have to repeat ourselves because that's how it actually gets into our spirit. So we want to be in the middle of the road in the highway of wholeness. We don't want to be, because we can so easily slip into ditches on this side, on that side. So when we get a truth, sometimes we'll go to this side and then we're like, no, now I'm out of balance. So now we've got to go to this side. So, But God wants to help us bring us balance. And we need the heart of God. We need to understand God's heart of love to, Amen. to do that. So what happens... Uh, what happens biologically to you when you don't accept who you are, when you don't love yourself. The first thing that happens is your body chemistry is this, that your serotonin levels begin to drop. So the Bible says we're to take every thought captive into the obedience of Jesus Christ. And so the enemy knows your chemistry. He's been to medical school. He knows how we, our body works. And there's a connection between your spirit, your soul, and your body. And if you, if you entertain negative thoughts about yourself and say, I don't love myself, I'm not good enough, and nobody loves me, you entertain those thoughts. What's happening neurologically inside you is sero the serotonin levels begin to change. Your body chemistry begins to change. Now, serotonin is a neurotransmitter that's released out of your nervous system, out of your uh, dendrites, out of your, there's another big word, I don't know what it is. It's part of your brain stem here. So what happens is um, your enemy knows how to do this, okay? He causes your serotonin levels to drop, or you do because you're meditating on those thoughts. And when these serotonin levels drop uh, th in the brain, um, it, it, your pain perception begins to change. So it affects uh, your sleep cycles, your wake cycles, your mood begins to change. Depression begins to come into your life because your serotonin levels are off because you're meditating on negative thoughts, okay? Uh, your sleep cycles, your wake cycles, your mood, all this begins to change. And so if the enemy can cause your, your serotonin levels to be low, what's going to happen to your pain perception? Everything's going to begin to shift, okay? Your waking cycles, your sleep cycles, your moods begin to change, and everything's going to go in the wrong direction, okay? So we see how Satan affects our body chemistry through thought life. And now neurosurgeons and that, that people who study the brain are realizing the body-spirit-soul connection that's really happening. When you think negative things, it creates chemicals in your body that create disease, which create disease over a long time. Does that make sense? And so we got to be very careful about what we think about ourselves. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so we ta talk more about this in the Highway to Wholeness. But for every thought, there's a chemical hormone and a neurotransmitter, a, ner a nerve signal released in response to that thought. So if you think good thoughts, happy thoughts, right? Good chemicals are released. If you think negative thoughts, negative chemicals are re released. And so serotonin is one of those neurotransmitters. So because Satan knows this, he knows the connection between your cerebral co cortex and your uh, hypothalamus, right? So he knows that your brain, is, he, can, he can control your body through your thought life. So it's so important that we learn to think correctly. We've got to deal with stinking thinking and start thinking the way God wants us to think. What does God have to say about who we are in him? Stop believing the lies because the lies are creating your body to go into a state of uneasiness or disease, which over time creates disease in your body. Amen? Mm -hmm. And so what happens is your hypothalamus, uh, we had an image there, I don't know if I still have it, it picks up on those unloving thoughts through the limbic system, and it causes your pineal gland, which is right in the center, it's a very small dot in the center of your brain, which regulates your serotonin levels in the body to lower them and to not secrete so much because the thoughts are telling us that we don't need serotonin. And when you have a serotonin deficiency, you don't feel right about yourself, especially in the area of being accepted and loved. And so everything, your, 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 your mind is so connected with what's going on in your body, okay? 
If you don't feel that well in your soul, in your emotions, okay, but if you would take your peace with God, with yourself and with others, guess what the hypothalamus is going to do? If you decide I'm going to meditate on how much God loves me and I'm going to stop listening to the stinking thinking about myself, guess what's going to happen? Okay, It's going to recognize that fulfillment and your brain is going to signal to your pineal gland and say, hey, crank up that serotonin and you're going to feel normal again the way God intended. And you're going to start the chemical of serotonin will begin to flow in your body because you're thinking on those things that are good and pure and lovely and good report. You're meditating on these things and all the serotonin levels begin to come. And over time, your body will begin to heal itself because God designed it to heal itself. Amen. And so we have to deal with stinking thinking. We have to learn to think the way God thinks about us if we want to live in victory. Amen? Amen. And sometimes, amen, healing sometimes is not instantaneous. Sometimes you just have to, that's why the Bible says, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. When you become thankful, when you become grateful, you you start talking that way. Your brain begins to connect your spirit, your soul, and your body. How many know we're created as three-part being, right? And so what happens is your serotonin levels begin to go. Your dopamine levels are, everything goes normalized, and the chemicals that are being released in your body create healing in your body, and you live the victorious life. Amen? Amen. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 27, My peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you. Not as the world gives it unto you. Let your hearts, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let your heart be afraid. And so we have to, as Christians, say, I refuse to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid of what of tomorrow. Uh, we understand that there's going to be a falling away. We understand that tribulations coming, persecutions coming, and people are going to you know deliver their family members or all this stuff. We read it. Jesus talks about it. Bad things are coming, and then Jesus says something crazy at the end. He goes, "Hey, but don't let your heart be troubled. Hey, I've overcome it all. It's all good. Just relax, right?" And so we have to make a decision as believers. I'm not going to be afraid because fear is not part of my life. I'm more than a conqueror through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. And what I'd like to say, too, just a little recap from last week, because we're doing this in two parts, at least. Um, if you didn't, if you were not here last week, I encourage you to listen to the message online, because it's good to hear in, in its context and even to be able to continue. And another thing I just wanted to summarize was, like, we were talking about that we are created with a need to be loved. That's a normal and healthy need that we all have, to be loved. By God, first of all, but then even loving one another, covering one another. There's certain structures that God has set up, you know. And fathers and husbands are, have a bit, very big part in covering mothers, uh, women and children. But we also cover one another. We're each other's keeper. You're your brother's keeper, the Bible says. So when, uh, when we turn to addictions and these different things, it gives us like a dopamine rush. And that mimics love. So... We were talking about the root root causes to why we go to addictions. And the thing is, we know God has been speaking to us. We're just on a journey with him. And we know as a church and as people that God wants us to be breakthrough people. And breakthrough people is breaking through those uh, strongholds, going at a deeper level. So you might say, well, why are we going so deep into this? You know, Because we can actually, we can just... Um, coat things. We can temporarily fix things. We can put like a band-aid on, but it's not going to really fix. It's not going to deal with the root causes. And that's what we're called, that's what we're called to do, to deal with root causes so we can eliminate, not just coat problems, but eliminate them and reprogram. We have to reprogram our thoughts, our minds, according to the word of God. And then we're going to start seeing results that last. You know, and, and it's a journey. So don't be discouraged if you're, you know, uh, if it takes a bit of time, and if you're stumbling a little bit, if you fall here and there, pick yourself back up again. Let's pick each other back up again because we're learning. We're an overcoming journey. So uh, Travis was talking about bewitchment and the simplicity of the gospel. So is it really that simple, you know, to have the gospel and the love of God come and fill you so you can overcome addictions? Yes, it is. It's that simple. When we find addictions, we find a person who's actually been separated from God, from themselves, and from others from other people. So they've been spiritually bewitched bewitched to the simplicity of the gospel. And that is the root to all addictions. Um, So now there's two ways to bring those serotonin levels up. 
one is natural and one is not. So the first and the best way is to be delivered from a spirit of unloving. And we cover that spirit more in depth. And we talk about that in the Highway to Wholeness. And it's an unclean spirit. And there's occultism as well. There's occultic spirit and there's unloving spirit behind addictions. And when you get delivered of that, then your, your hypothalamus is going to respond to those correct thoughts that you start getting instead of listening to those spirits anymore. And boom, you're going to have good results happening. You'll be having a happy day. The second way you can deal with this and bring the serotonin level up is through medication. So does medication work? Yeah, a lot of times it does. But does it solve the problem? No. So it's like a coating. It's like a Band-Aid. And your enemy knows that um, if you do that, if you go that route, then he has now produced a chemical imbalance in your body. And uh, because of that unloving spirit, so now he wants to be your solution. And that to me is just so evil, because first of all, he's the one who caused the problem. So he, be he comes along and he bewitches you and he causes the problem, and then he comes along and wants to be your solution as well. So, you know, he'll say, well, I've got an answer for you. Just turn to this drug over here, or just go to this addiction over here. Just go to this addiction over there. Because you know what? One addiction leads to another. One addiction leads to another. So it's just a never-ending cycle. And addictions, we were talking about last week, that it's not always just those visible things. You know, the drugs, the alcohol, the, you know, whatever it can be. But it can be as anything that you set your affection on that's not God and God's rooted in God's love. Anything that takes over that source of, source of comfort that God wants to be to you. So then the devil will say, of course, I've got an answer for you. And uh, he tries to be both the cause and the solution for it. And that's just really evil. And all the while, he's just keeping us separated from the true source of um, our freedom, which is God and his love. And we can show that to one another. We can, show, we can learn to love ourselves too. You know, this was kind of something that I thought has been, you know, so looked, overlooked in our lives. So we are, we are to love ourselves. We are to be our own best friend next to God. You know, if you don't like to hang out with yourself, that's actually not healthy. Sometimes we have this, I mean, I come from Sweden and I love, there's many good things in my culture, but we all have different things in our cultures that are, are not godly. And I was raised with, um, in Sweden, we have something called jantelagen, and it means don't you think you're something special. So it's almost like a fear of pride or fear of acknowledging the good things that God has made in you. So that's the way I was raised. So it, And I realized how ungodly that is and how that in itself can create disease and different things because God actually wants you to love yourself and to want to be with yourself, you know, instead of waking up in the morning and turning to all these addictions, all this, to connect and to get and that, you should be able to yeah. look in the mirror and say, good morning, myself. Yeah, and so, so, you know, I mean, before you know, I was a Christian, I'm just going to interject for a second, yeah. you know, um, I really didn't like myself. When I got around, I was the life of the party when I hung out with my friends and stuff, and everyone thought I was happy, Go. everyone thought, you know, I was, you know, popular, whatever I was, I was, but when I was alone, I didn't like myself. I didn't want to be alone. I would sit by myself and be like, I got to go to a movie, I got to go hang out with someone, because I didn't like being with myself. But when I became a Christian and I started to experience the presence of God and engage with God's presence, and when I had a revelation of his love, I would, my friends would call, you want to go see a movie? And I'd be like, no, you know what, I've got an appointment. What are you doing? Oh, never mind. And I'd just like literally sit in my, my basement and play my guitar and worship God or read the Bible. And I actually enjoyed talking to God about myself. And so that was the biggest shift in my life. When you get born again, you're on a journey to begin to love yourself again because God wants to reveal to you that he, you are the apple of his eye. And so you should be the apple of your eye too. Amen? You should say, hey, God has created a beautiful thing and I'm going to love myself. Amen? Go and ahead. if you don't have that love that right now, that's okay because you can get there. You can get on the journey. We're all, like I said, we're on a journey. And you can ask God to do that to you, you know, to... Like one thing that I did in my process with God was I was asking God in my heart. I said, how do you see me? Like, who am I to you? Because, who, like, who do you say that I am? Because there's so many lies. Other people will tell you who you are and who you're not. Maybe your siblings as you're growing up, you're so dumb, you know, whatever. There's little things. And we sometimes we take those to heart. And even the things we say to ourselves, like, you're so stupid. I did this again. You know, I, I was thinking we have mercy well, we're taught, anyways, to have mercy on others. But why is it we have mercy on others, but we can be so hard on ourselves? You know, like, when we have failed and we have messed up, why can't we just look in a mirror and say, okay, I, yes, I messed up, but that's okay. 
uh, you can have another chance. You know, if we can learn to be more good to ourselves too, then we're going to find that we're going to be more healthy. And the thing is, we might think that in order for us, like, you know, sometimes we might think that, like, it's not that we're going to be stuck on ourselves. Because we're not going to, we, it's, it's better to esteem others higher than yourself. So it's, again, it's talking about that balance. We don't want to be stuck on ourselves and be all that. But when we can have a healthy love for ourselves, an acknowledgement of that God loves us and that he wants us to have that, then we can actually love other people better too. Somebody said that the way you treat yourself is usually how you're going to end up treating other, the way you handle your own heart is usually how you're going to end up handling other people's heart. So if you find a person that's really critical or sarcastic or something, it's a good gauge to what they're, what's going on inside their own heart, their own conversations with themselves. You know, if, if you have perfectionism in your life or something, many times it's because you're holding yourself at a very high standard. Yeah, and I remember in, in Bible school, I, I was hanging out with this girl. She was a good friend of mine, and she was very sarcastic. And we, we had a little group of friends. As You know, you, you get in little cliques with your friends. And this girl was always sarcastic, and I would get so angry. I would just, like, snap. And I was like, why are you so sarcastic? You know, and I was like, it means you're wounded, you know, if you're sarcastic. And I would get mad about it, but then I realized it's because I, I'm sarcastic. Amen. <laughs> and the things you see and bo- that bother you in other people are usually issues that you have in your own life. Amen. And so you get married to, you know, to your prince or to your princess, and they're perfect in your eye. But after about 12 months, the masks start to come off, and, and then you begin to realize, right, the issues in their lives, right, begin to bother you, issues, usually right? the issues you have in your life, right? So... The mask comes off, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, So we need to have a righteous indignation against these things. Um, The Bible talks about a righteous anger, and we need to get righteously indignant against these lies, because look what it's doing to mankind. It just brings so much bondage, because the enemy knows that he will engineer thoughts, he will create thoughts just to try and get you into areas of fulfillment that are not coming from God. So here's actually your part. Yeah, and, and that's true. And, you know, I like to explain it this way. The Bible says very clearly that our, our fight is not with flesh and blood, amen, but principalities and powers in the heavenly places, right? And then Paul says, take every thought into captivity because the battle is in the mind. See, the battle's in the mind. And so when you walk into this church, right, and you open your phone and you, and you, you can catch up to me or Melanie and say, hey, what's the password for the Wi-Fi? As soon as you put that password and you have access to an invisible source of information that's being transferred to your device and then being translated through coding system into you, images and, and thoughts and information. How many hear what I'm saying? Well, it works that way in the spirit realm. There's thoughts that are coming through a Wi-Fi connection in the realm of the spirit that your mind is picking up and translating. And so you need to realize that... A lot of thoughts you're having, they're not even your own thoughts. They're coming, you're thinking, oh, I'm so stupid. Well, you know what, that thought might not even be f- coming from you. It's being coming in f- through the Wi-Fi of hell, and you're, you're, you're capturing that thought, and you're listening to it, and you're meditating on it when you're supposed to be pulling it down and saying, no, you're not going to have a place in my life. Right. You, right? Amen? I'm loved by God. I'm the apple of his eye. I'm an overcomer. I can do all things through Christ. These are lies. And you begin to pull down those thoughts and watch what God will do in your life, and watch your health, and watch your joy, and watch your peace begin to increase. Amen? That's what God wants to do. So, um, see where we were here in our notes here. So, um, another thing here I just wanted to touch on as well. I'm going to make everyone really... It's so interesting how it actually has such physical effect. And when you start seeing the connections, as we've been studying about root causes and different diseases and the links, it's so cool to see how they just make sense. I remember when we were first just starting to press into this journey, I would, you know, you'd hear about a root cause and connect it to a disease. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that kind of, how do they know that? That seems kind of loose. But now as I'm seeing it, I'm seeing the, the dots get more connected. Yeah. For example, they said like a root cause too when you have anger, like, or the things that you can get, like hemorrhoids or Erica's veins or what do you call those... Um, aneurysms and stuff like that it's the root cause is anger and it makes sense you know if you're angry you go like the rage and it just yeah. blows up and then your veins pop mm-hmm. so it's like amazing how these spiritual and what's going on in our spirit soul and body like it just affects our body it's connected to your thoughts yeah it's correct so you can learn to nip the anger and so you're actually doing yourself harm when you're yielding to that anger yeah so when you can learn to just no chill yeah. i'm gonna just go to god he's not fretting like i am then Amen. you can learn to actually reverse right. those things. And again, it could be, um, you know, I just got some kids in here. I want to be careful what I say here, but on Sunday morning. But, you know, it could be pornography. And, I mean, that could be an addiction for people. 
uh, and the reason why is because uh, when images are looked at, or for women, if you're reading romance novels about these fairy tale, you know, romances <laughs> that don't really exist in real life, you know, like the man is perfect. How many know there's no perfect man? Amen. Okay, if there is, it's not on this planet, right? Maybe they'll turn one up in uh, on Mars somewhere. I don't know. Um, but when 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 that part of your mind is triggered, we were designed for intimacy, and what happens is there's a release of dopamine, and the high levels of dopamine is released, and it, it's out of order, and you can become addicted to right? that How stuff because pornography leads obviously to other things, and, and it releases dopamine, which which will cause a um, uh, so so that that we need to understand that that was something that was confined by God for marriage, and it's supposed to happen in the marriage bed. It's supposed to happen in the proper context. And so we have a bunch of people today that are addicted to um, pornography and other sexual sins because they, they want their dopamine fix. Amen? And it brings and, such guilt and, and torment, it, right? And, when and it's it always order. brings guilt and torment. Addictions. When you begin to build cisterns and you begin to fill them, it always brings guilt and shame. Even in the Garden of Eden, they were ashamed and they hid themselves for they were naked. And they sewed together fig tree, fig leaves to make coverings for themselves, the first bikinis. And so this is what's happening today still. You build your own cistern. You find your own way that's not God. What happens is you feel naked. You feel ashamed. And you begin to, you begin to, and, and people begin to build religious systems. Amen? And that's why we have religions where you got to pray five times a day. And you have to do this. And you have to do that to try to appease God. Well, listen, we're past that. Because Christianity is the only religion that teaches us all by the grace of God. Amen. We couldn't pay for our sin. Amen? And that Jesus paid for our sin. The precious Lord and Savior died on the cross to pay for our sin. And we receive it as a free gift. Our righteousness is his righteousness. Amen? Mm -hmm. And then we begin to walk it out. That's why we do teaching. We walk it out. We learn how to understand how the enemy attacks. Okay? And so the enemy is always trying to send false comforters into our lives. Okay? And uh, we need to be aware of that. Okay? Many times as children, we weren't loved correctly. Um, maybe we haven't loved our husbands and wives correctly. We've raged. We have rage or rejection in our lives within us because we weren't loved properly. So now we just, at a subconscious level, we begin to, we're, we're sharp with other people. We're not loving because we weren't loved. Well, God wants to fill the love bank so that all you know is the love of God. And so it pours out of you. And it's, it's organic. It's something that's natural in your life. And that's the goal. When we grow, it's organic. Say, everything's organic. Everything is organic. God wants you to flow. All the laws that you keep in the Word of God, all the commandments you keep, you do it because you're hanging on to the love of God. And it becomes organic. It becomes natural. You share your faith because you're so in love with Him, you just want to tell everybody. And you're concerned. Your only, your only concern in life should be, the only stress you should carry, if you carry any, is the stress for those who are going to hell that don't know the Savior, who have been deceived by the enemy. We should be concerned, and we should be praying for the lost. But as in regards to our own life, we need to live in joy and peace. Amen? Amen. 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 Go ahead, Camilla. Okay. Page 13. So, yeah, there's a lot of material here. And I, I encourage you, if you haven't gone to Highway to Wholeness, when we, uh, we're going to do that again. And May, I would encourage yeah. you to go. And we're probably going to start creating some format when we do a little bit more, whether it's monthly or weekly, something for those who want to dig into deeper. So we're passing by some things here, but we're trying to get the most important today. So separation, that's why that's so key. We were talking about, Travis was talking about the commandment. You know, we need to love the Lord our God and then love your neighbor as yourself. So there's three levels that God created you to have fellowship and have that connection with himself, with you, yourself, and then with others. And likewise, the enemy comes to separate you on those three levels. He wants to bring separation between you and God, between you and you, and between you and others. And that's where the mess up happens. That's where the diseases happen. And uh, with all the pain and all this. And, and the other thing that we were talking about last week was that we many times have pain because none of us have been spared. We're all, there's not one of us here that hasn't had something that wasn't correct happen to us because um, we're in a fallen world. So, um, you know, we all have pain and different things. So that's why something like Caring for the Heart is created. Uh, it's a ministry that deals with the pain in your heart. And so don't be... 
uh, intimidated when, you know, it's a bit of a vulnerable walk. It's fragile a little bit. We can't just barge into each other's hearts or own our own heart. Like Jesus, he said, I came and I'm knocking at your door. If anyone is there, open and I will come in. So he's gentle. So we need to be gentle as well with ourselves and with other people's hearts. So caring for the heart and dealing with that pain, the different things that we have in our lives that has been an open door to welcome junk in, welcome sins and, and all this. Um, so, yeah, so when we haven't, um, so we've had things, all of us have had things that wasn't correct, we said that, but are we going to go forward in life and just continue to uh, look for comfort in the wrong places because of this, or are we going to practice separation? We have to learn to practice separation when we, when we um, you know, the Bible says that we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against principalities and, and wicked hosts, and it takes on a new meaning when you see it in the light of this. Um, so, for example, in, even in our marriage relationship, when, when I had gone down to the For My Life conference and we learned about accusation, that the enemy, one of the biggest ways he wants to bring separation is through accusation, where we accuse ourselves, others, or even God. And so we came home, and we're people of habit, so we create habits. And those are the things that we have to reprogram now, and we have to catch ourselves. And it's a good thing when we catch ourselves. So I remember I came home, and Travis, by habit, threw out some little accusation. And I remember I, <laughs> in, normally I would come back with another accusation, and we would have ping pong. We'd play with our sins with each other. <laughs> but this time I caught myself and said, no, I can't agree with that anymore. And he goes, oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Good. actually how simple it can work. You, when you can go, oh, wait a minute, I'm, I'm going to take inventory of what's going on in my thoughts, in my actions, and in our relationships. And so we, you know, even if you have to make a little light of it or a joke and say, okay, you know, that wasn't from God, or that I'm not going to receive that. So that's kind of how we're walking it out now. And there's times where we yield for it, and we're like, well, that went really well, <laughs> you know. But that's then we start over again. So again, remember we have to have mercy. So we need to practice separation like Paul did in Romans 7. So when, when somebody hurts you, if you can, your natural thing is, the hard thing is we see the face and we look and we think it's the person. But if we can kind of dim the face and realize that we are spirit beings and that, you know, it can be the enemy tempting and work operating. The enemy can operate, even if I'm a saved person, he can operate in me. If I'm not sanctified in an area, if I'm wounded, or if I'm not careful to yield myself to the word of God, I can hurt you, you know, and because the things that the enemy does, he's a very intelligent spirit. So he know, he sets up events. So we might think it's just coincidence, but it isn't. And he studies your family tree, he studies your iniquities, and he has a way in there. So if you're not careful, if I'm not careful, and we don't reprogram, and even, like, he's been studying your generations, you should be studying your generations. Like, when I started realizing the things that were operating in my life, I looked back and I thought, oh! My grandma did that. Yes, my, my did mom that. did this, my grandma did this, and now I'm about to do it, and I'm about to give it to my kids, if, if something doesn't change, right? But we, the good news is we can say, hey, no, we're going to become more intelligent now, we're going to become, we're going to outsmart him, and say, so the enemy knows, he's, he knows the word of God, he, is, he knows familiar spirits. He knows the things, and he can mimic those things, too, in our family tree. Mm -hmm. So we have to become smarter, and instead of being bewitched to him, we have to be set free by the truth of God. So if you can learn to separate the person, you know, who did that horrible thing to you, and understand that it was the enemy operating through them, even if it's a godly person, you know, all of us have both good and evil because we're not, we're not perfected yet fully. And we're in a journey of overcoming. So if you can learn to separate and say it wasn't really the person, because they probably didn't know how they hurt you. Because if they did, they probably wouldn't have done it. Amen. So many times it's the enemy that's so intelligent as he sets up events. And he'll use your closest ones many times. Yeah. And you look at them and you go, you're so evil, you're so mean. And yeah, we, We've come to a place now where we realize more than anything that sickness in our bodies is not happenstance. It's no. a planned event by the enemy. And through thoughts, because we think a certain way. And That's why the Bible situations. says we're to renew our mind with the Word of God, right? Because it has the power to go deep into the very marrow. The Bible says bones in the marrow. In the marrow of the bone is where your immune system is developed. Amen? And so God wants us to let the Word go deep in our lives and renew our minds. So we need to have compassion on those even who abused us. That's why the Bible says, bless those who persecute you. And you might think, that's really hard. But when you're realizing that it's actually not them, that it's the enemy through them, yeah. even through yourself, look at when you are tempted to say, 
oh, I'm so stupid, I did it again, how can I do this? But when you stop and think, no, it was actually the enemy that I yielded to in, in and through me, it wasn't me, then it's probably easier to forgive yourself too and say, oh, I just fell for it, I just got bewitched. Amen. So when you can learn to have compassion more on other people and on yourself, that's going to help. Because, you know, they will probably abuse themselves because it's cycles that whatever, hurt people hurt people. So when you've been hurt, many times you'll reproduce that hurt if you don't get healing and love. So we break the cycle through yeah. forgiveness, forgiveness. And the enemy has been working overtime to take us out because he hates God. So that's why he hates us too because we are of God and we're from God. Amen. And part of how he takes us out is through addictions, through being spiritually bewitched. So here's another interesting thing I want to bring to your attention. I don't know if you thought about this. I think this is really cool. You know, well, he takes us out through food, cigarettes, sweets, things that come to the mouth. And you know what's really cool? If you think about, do you know that so, why so many addictions have to do with the mouth? Even the apple in the Garden of Eden had to do with the mouth, eating it. Because that's a place of nurturing. Think about it, a baby when they're first born. What is the first instinct and need a little baby has when they're first coming out? Well, they want to they wanna suck. They want to nurture at the breast. So the nurses really quickly take the baby and puts it on the breast. Because that's one of the really mm -hmm. big need that we all have. And when we haven't had that nurturing in different ways, like when we haven't been properly covered and loved by those we're supposed to be, mm -hmm. then we, that it's missing. Amen. And now it's being substituted through all these addictions. That's right. Um, so. so that's really important. So that's why we are very big on mentoring. You know, the Bible says you older women teach the younger women. Like spiritual mothers and fathers are so important because we're created with that need of being Amen. nurtured, all of us, and mentored. So I don't know if you're listening to that lie that you're not live, loved by God. Amen. So we're, we're going we're gonna to stop with that because we've got, we got a lot, a lot of material. But a uh, couple things. First of all, did you guys catch my pun in the first verse? I'm just really curious. The first verse... You know, God will not allow us to be tempted more than we can bear. No, you didn't get it? It's a bear? Okay, just, all right, sorry. I just had to say that. Okay, so now you get it, okay. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19, we're going to close with this verse. And like I said, we're going we're gonna to do some more of this. We're redoing the highway to wholeness. We're going to make it longer. We're going to do it in probably, we're looking at May. And if you want to go back through it, you can go through that thing three or four times and God is talking to you and you're just getting more you never and more. Have too it's much. just amazing, amazing what God will do in your life. So Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 to 19 says this, and then you probably have something else to share. Just maybe a sentence. And then uh, Christ will make his home in your hearts, okay, as you trust in him, okay? So we know that we want the Lord to be at home in us, amen? It's, it, he's with us, he's central to us, and we need to allow your roots will grow de deep what into what? <coughs> into God's what? Love. Love. Yes. And so we need to let our roots go deep into God's love and acceptance for us and keep you strong. Amen? Next verse, it says here. We've got the next verse, Brian, verse 19. Okay. Uh, that you may experience the love of Christ, though it's, it's too great to understand fully. We can't even understand. You can't, have, have you ever tried to explain the love of God to someone? If you've, it's just so hard. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from only God. Amen? And so perfect love casts out fear. Perfect, perfect love. We're on a journey to get to know the love of God and understand the depths of God. And in doing so, healing begins to flow and addictions begin to fall off. Addictions won't even stay. You know, if you get people delivered from an unloving spirit and they begin to love themselves, they're not going to want addictions anymore. They just fall off. Those empty cisterns, they just, they just become, you know, they just become prisons or wells or something. I mean, you, you don't worry about those anymore. Go ahead, Camilla. Yeah, and the Bible says that we learn line upon line and precept upon precept. And here little, there little. So the repetition, it's going to happen, and that's important. That's part of, you know, line upon line because we need to get it mm -hmm. from the Word of mm -hmm. God. So we're going to be doing a lot of that mm -hmm. repetition. So, Amen. And this is a thing, too. We're all on a journey. And I'm the type of person I get really excited because I don't look at this and say, you know, I've, I've got to become a better person because the, the, the reality is I'm, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The way I think about it is I've got to walk this thing out because I'm being prepared for eternity. And I'm getting to every time I, I, I align myself more closely with God's word, the more life and the more presence and the more pleasing I am to him. And it's all burst out of relationship. It's not a thou shall not anymore. Now it's a 
relational thing. Amen? And so we begin to walk in holiness, and it becomes beautiful. Amen? Let's stand. We're going to Just one more thing, too, because, you know, don't be surprised if you're starting to be really hungry to know more, because that's kind of what this does. It just creates a hunger for more. It's like God wants to... He's a jealous God, and he wants that affection, and he wants you to be hooked on him, on his word, on his love. Amen. Where you're just like, I need more. I need to know more. I need to dig in more. Amen. That's what we encourage you to dig into the word Amen. of God for yourself. So, how many received something from this teaching? Let me see your hands. Yeah. Amen. Okay, I'm going to pray over you, and then I'm going to open the altars. If you want prayer for anything, we have the prayer team here. Also, and specifically, if you want to just say, I just want to know the love of God. I want to return to my first love. I want it to be about love. And I want to love myself the way God loves me. Then you respond to that. We're going to believe that the prayer team, when they're praying for you, that you'll get a a great revelation of that. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, right now for every person here, God, under the sound of my voice. Father, I thank you that you love each person here (laughs) and that while they were yet sinners, you died for them. You went after them. Uh, you You were willing to leave the house and run to the prodigal. The the prophets never did it. The servants never did it. But Father, you did it because your heart is love. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're gonna you're gonna minister your love over this season to every person here. That they're gonna know how deep and how rich and how awesome the love of God is. And Father, right now I speak to the neurology and to the nerve endings of everyone who is bound by prescription drugs, and I command them to be cleansed. Anyone who is bound by any kind of addiction to, uh, to illegal drugs, in the name of Jesus, I release you from that, and I release you from that ancestral bondages and from those genetic impurities that might be in your system. And I command right now that all serotonin levels be normalized, all dopamine levels be normalized in the name of Jesus. Because, Father, it's not by strength, it's not by might, but it's by your power, by your spirit. And, Father, I speak to any imbalance of biochemistry, Lord. And I command it to be normalized in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray for creative miracles. If there's creative miracles that need to be done, Father, all things are possible. I thank you for creative miracles would begin to descend on your people, Lord, that you'll just bring balance in the mind in every area, Father, in Jesus' name, Lord. I bless your people, and I thank you, Father, that we are overcomers, and we're in the army of the Lord, and we're going to do great battles for you, Father. And we are, we're like... uh, I just see like military people in, in, in bridal gowns, you know, like we've got the combat boots, but we're, we're the bride of Christ, but we're going to war and we're loved by God. And I thank you for it. And all God's people said, amen. amen.